All right, so let's move into the diesel cycle. First of all, I want to compare the auto cycle with the diesel cycle. Now, the auto cycle models uh, gasoline, and the diesel cycle models the other fuel, the diesel fuel. How does a gasoline uh, initiate combustion? With the spark, spark plug. Does a diesel have a spark plug? No, it doesn't. It's a compression ignition. And so what happens with the diesel cycle is it has a fuel injector, a fuel injector. So when it goes the compression stroke, there's no air-fuel mix. It's just pure air. And then when it gets up to where it wants to start the combustion process, it starts to spray in the fuel. And the little fuel injector typically has different outlets. I don't know how many will spray out in a pattern. And the design engineers want to have a nice swirl to it so the air is swirling as you're compressing it. And then as it swirls and it makes a nice combustion, actually tumbling and swirling. Actually, there's some experts at Southwest Research Institute right down the road who are uh, the world leaders in uh, combustion of uh, diesel engines, uh, doing the work all the time. Okay, so, but the, it's with a, it's, it's a fuel injection and once you start adding the fuel, it starts to combust. So the process of the compression between the auto and the diesel is the same. But what happens here at the auto cycle, we thought, okay, it's constant volume heat addition. But in the diesel cycle, there's a change. It's a constant pressure heat addition. Okay, so what happens is, is the characteristic of the fuel is when you're spraying it in, you're going to spray it in for a time, and the fuel ejector is going to be spraying it in for a number of milliseconds, I don't know how many, and then it's going to be burning as it's spraying in, and then when you turn off the fuel, then it will uh, finish out the combustion, but it will then continue the, the power stroke or the, the expansion. So while you are spraying in fuel and it's combusting, it's constant pressure. That's our assumption in the diesel cycle. And then you cut off the fuel after it's expanded some. And then it continues to expand more, but it's now finishing it out by an adiabatic expansion. That's the big difference. So here it was adiabatic expansion all the way from top dead to bottom dead. Here. No, you're going to have constant pressure to a cutoff, and then you're going to finish it with adiabatic expansion. The constant volume heat rejection is the same. Let's try and draw this on a PV diagram and then compare it with the auto cycle PV diagram. So 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. Here for the diesel cycle, it's a much a larger compression ratio. Typically, the compression ratio in auto or gasoline is around 10, or 10 to 1 they call it, and for diesel it would be around 20, 18, 19, 20, 20 to 1. So if you want to try and draw it a little more accurately, put it close to the y-axis, and then you're going to have much higher pressure temperature, and then you have constant pressure, heat addition as you're modeling this combustion, but then you get out to state three, and you're going to cut off the fuel, and you're going to finish the expansion down to four. So one to two to three to four on the auto, and then one to two to three to four on the diesel. Okay, so right away we have a cutoff ratio. It's a new parameter. So what is that cutoff ratio? It's the, the volume at state three when you stopped the fuel, stopped the constant pressure, heat addition, divided by the volume at the start, which was the minimum volume. This could be two point something, 2.2, 2.0, you know, 1.8, three, somewhere like that. It's not gonna be like 20, <laughs> right? It's just a, a, a number where it's still above one, and that's the cutoff. So it's the volume for the end of the heat addition divided by the volume at the start, which is at top dead center. Um, they give a subscript C. 
Sometimes I point things out that are conceptually a little challenging to me. So, somebody says, um, R is what? R is a compression ratio. What is the letter for the start of the word compression? C. And so I've seen textbooks use R subscript C for compression ratio. So it's a little tricky for me because this book, I want to be consistent with it, they use C for cutoff. So R without a subscript is the compression ratio. R with a C is a cutoff ratio. Okay. So we want to definitely go through, we already sketched this on a P, V diagram, one to two to three to four. We could also sketch it on a TS diagram, need to be able to do that. And we want to you know, emphasize the big difference between what we already know, the auto cycle and the new cycle, the diesel cycle, it's constant pressure heat addition. So it would be like one to two, out to three, down, and then four back. We want to be able to, for each of those processes, write the first and second law, and then drop out those terms, just like we did for the auto cycle. So for the second law, the sigma is zero in all of these. Why? Why? That's our standard assumption, isn't it? What does sigma represent? Entropy generation due to irreversibilities, and our diesel and our auto cycle are going to be all internally reversible. So that's why this term is all zero. And then we look at it and we say, hmm, on the second law, which of these processes have no heat transfer? Which ones are adiabatic? Is 1 to 2 adiabatic? Yeah, and so 1 to 2 is adiabatic, hence no heat transfer, and it's isentropic. Maybe I shouldn't have drawn it on a TS diagram straight up. I knew, I, I knew the answer, right? So there you go. And then 3 to 4? Yeah, and so it's straight up, three to four or straight down. And then here you have heat addition. Sometimes they draw it like that, Q, two to three coming in. And then heat rejection, Q, four to one going out. Adiabatic right there. All right, <clears throat> first law. The first law for process one to two looks a lot like the auto cycle. So it was adiabatic. And so if somebody says, I want you to calculate the work, 1 to 2, it's equal to the negative of, or just switch the, the, the um, order, u1 minus u2. Don't forget that minus sign, right? Okay. But the big difference is the first law for the process 2 to 3. Okay. For the process 2 to 3, the constant pressure heat addition is Q2 to 3 or W2 to 3 equal to 0? Which one of those two is equal to 0? Neither. Yeah, neither. Okay. But what happens is you can develop the work 2 to 3 is solvable because it's constant pressure. Is that equal to PDV in principle? And then I can pull out that pressure because it's constant. It's equal to P times V3 minus V2. And when I multiply it by V3, put P3 there. And when I multiply it by P2, put P2 there, because P2 is equal to P3. So I just for convenience, oh, when I'm multiplying by V3, put P3. And when I'm multiplying by V2, put P2. So I can replace that here in this equation. And then I can rewrite the first law, let me kind of draw it down here. I'll put U3 minus U2 is equal to Q2 to 3 minus P3V3 minus P2V2. Am I going too slow? You're with me? What's my next step? Flip them over to the other side. Why would we want to move these over to the other side? I guarantee I will get a question from somebody in this room, even right before the final exam. Professor, I'm studying for the final exam. Happens every semester. 
And I went back and I reviewed the auto cycle and the diesel cycle. And for some odd reason, for the auto cycle, the heat addition, Q2 to 3, is a change in U. Yeah, you're right. And then my notes say that the Q2 to 3 for the diesel cycle is a change in H. Why? I get that question all the time. Here it is right here. You know how many times I've had to repeat this explanation? How about this semester, everybody? You're going to get this right now so we don't have to repeat it when you see me and ask questions? As soon as we flip that over to the other side, what we get is we get that H3 minus H2 is equal to Q2 to 3. Right? And it's almost like incredible. Like, how did that ever come about? Because it's a constant pressure work. We can do that integral PDV, throw it to the other side, and you get de delta H. So this is for the diesel cycle. That's the big difference. Okay. If you come down here for the process three to four, it's adiabatic expansion. And then it's constant volume heat rejection. Very similar to the auto cycle. The big difference is that's the state. So work it out. This is the big difference. The rest of it looks very familiar. Okay. Uh, professor, is there still a work two to three? Or does this equation mean it's zero? No, I'm just saying it's been flipped to the other side and now Q is related to delta H. But the work two to three is not zero, is it? It's positive. All right. Somebody says, how can I calculate that work two to three? It'll be P3V3 minus P2V2. Isn't it? Yeah. Somebody says, does PV equal to RT at all times in this cycle? Is, is, does it always behave as an ideal gas? It does. So could I replace the P3 V3 by R times T3? And could I replace the P2 V2 by R times T2? And then you'll see, oh, the work 2 to 3 is equal to R T3 minus T2. About this time, some students throw up their hands like, oh, I'm so confused. Let's get, why can't we just have one equation to solve one problem and then no more other equations? Why, why can't the world be that easy? Sorry, it's not, right? So there it is. So if you're looking to solve for the work from 2 to 3 off, then it's just R delta T. Okay, let me ask this. Does this assume constant specific heats? Or does it also work for variable specific heats? It works for variable, it works for constant. That's incredible. Yeah, that's true. Very good. You're, you're, you're following along. Very good. But as I've written it right here, this delta U, this delta H, this, those are all assuming variable specific heats. If I want to switch it to constant specific heats, all I do is put C sub V uh, T2 minus T1. True? How about the delta H? C sub P T3 minus T2. Is that true for the, the change in the enthalpy if you assume constant specific heats? Okay, I guess I'm putting you to sleep. All right, let's move on. Go look at this video if you want to see the derivation of this thermal efficiency for the standard uh, diesel cycle assuming constant specific heats. It's, it looks a whole lot like the Otto, right? but it has some additional multiplier right in here. That's that term right there, okay? And uh, you would see that you have this R sub C. You know that what, what that is, right? R subscript C is called the cutoff ratio. And you see it here and here, and you have this K, and you have this K, and you have the K. Hey, K shows up three times in that equation. 1.4 for cold air analysis. And R is the compression ratio. All right, solve a problem with constant specific heats. 
What is my recommended step one? Get diagrams. Clearly label your states. Clearly know what's the process between states. Adiabatic, isentropic, constant pressure, constant volume. Then get a table of my state properties, especially temperature. Then get a table of energy transfers. Do a little bookkeeping. Make sure that they match. Otherwise, energy is not conserved. Yes, we can do calculations and we get all discombobulated in our math and we're generating energy on our paper or destroying energy in our calculations. Either one is wrong. has to match. And then calculate your thermal efficiency. You can check it with the cold air analysis equation that we just showed. That's great. Good confirmation. And you can calculate the mean effective pressure. Here's a plot. Draw on two scale for this problem. I know that uh, when I make those little sketches, they look a whole lot different than true to scale. But this is true to scale. Uh, basically, you have to undergo a lot of compression before the pressure really takes off. And the pressure does take off near the top dead center. Okay. Uh, you could do, take the same problem and you just change those words right there. Whoa. You have a bunch more work, variable specific heats. I encourage you to do auto cycle, constant variables, diesel cycle, constant variable specific heat assumptions. Very similar, you're just gonna go and use that table A22. You have to do some interpolation. You're gonna be using those visa bars for the isentropic parts, and you're gonna be looking up both U's and H's. U's and H's. The H is for the heat addition in the constant pressure part of, of the cycle in state two to three. Hey, we had three choices when we go to the gas station for the octane. True. What about the diesel? Do they have three selections of diesel? <laughs> it's one. And uh, that's it. And it's a diesel grade number two. There's no selection on it. You'll even see sometimes they'll have a centane, cetane number reported at the pump or even just it's just reported to be diesel number two. Okay. Um, diesel engines, diesel has always been the cheap fuel. It always has been. And so it's gotten more expensive when they took the sulfur out and they reduced the sulfur content. Uh, but uh, it has traditionally been very cheap. Also, uh, this is grabbed out of a Ford owner's manual, 20, what is that, 15, 16 diesel. So they have the ultra low sulfur diesels, what's required, uh, maximum 15 ppm sulfur in your vehicle. Okay, you can also put in up to 20% biodiesel, no problem, it'll work but don't go greater than 20%. And this is always interesting. Don't put in home heating oil. I guess a few people tried or did that. Agricultural diesel, no, bad. It'll run, but it's, uh, as some students told me, it evades taxes. And so the police will pull you over and check what you got and fine you because you're evading taxes. Raw fats and oils, uh, yeah. Waste cooking greases and high, too much biodiesel. And then don't add gasoline, gasohol, or alcohol to diesel fuels. I guess that was a common practice years ago. Here's a summary. Make sure we understand mean effective compression ratio, cutoff ratio, deficiencies for auto and diesel. And congratulations, we'll move on next time into Brayton cycle. Thank you.